Hello everyone, I welcome you all to the rapid recall of NEET PG 2024 Physiology Questions with me Dr. Abhirami, your Physiology Faculty at Manipal Medes. First of all, we are so happy that we have a 100% strike rate in Physiology from Manipal Medes. We had few questions which had a pure physiological theoretical basis and most of the questions in physiology had a very strong clinical integration with medicine. Most of the medicine questions had a very strong physiological basis. There were around 16 to 17 questions like this. Let's start our discussion with the first question. Choose the right option regarding function of mechanical receptors. Pacinian fast vibration that was the right answer. Ruffini sustained pressure, Meissner corpuscle for stretching, Merkel cells for slow vibrations. I am so happy that we had the discussion of the same topic and almost the same question. Pacinian corpuscle senses fast vibration. The tactile receptors are of four types. Meissner, Merkel, Ruffini and Pacinian. Pacinian exclusively for fast vibration. Vibrations 30 to 800 hertz. Slow vibrations are sensed by Meissner corpuscles, vibrations less than 30 hertz. Ruffini, although Ruffini can sense sustained pressure, which was there in the option, uh, this is not the most important function of Ruffini. Ruffini is responsible for rotation of joints. R for rotation of joints, that is the most important function of Ruffini. So that is why we go with option A, Pacinian corpuscle for fast vibration, that is the a most appropriate answer. Over to question number 2. RMP, resting membrane potential, predominantly affected by which of the following ions? A repeatedly asked topic and a repeatedly asked question also. Potassium ions. So I am happy that we had discussed the same concept in our regular Manipal Medes physiology videos where I told you that resting membrane potential is mainly contributed by potassium ions why mainly potassium ions we have so many ions why only potassium because at rest the cell is most permeable to potassium only that is why rmp mainly depends on potassium ion concentration so the answer is option a potassium over to question number three another question from uh, neuromuscular junction and neurophysiology Sequence the events in neuromuscular action potential conduction. So we are happy that we had the discussion of neuromuscular junction in our videos in nerve muscle physiology, in our regular class videos. So we had discussed the steps or the events in the neuromuscular junction. The first step, voltage gated sodium channels open in the nerve and therefore sodium entry. This sodium causes action potential in the nerve. And this action potential triggers the opening of calcium channels in the nerve. And this calcium causes movement of vesicles to release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. This acetylcholine crosses the neuromuscular junction to bind to the nicotinic receptors on the motor end plate. Motor end plate means on the muscle. And again there is opening of voltage gated sodium channels on the motor end plate or the muscle. And action potential. SR releases calcium. Calcium causes movement of myofilaments, actin and myosin. Therefore, the muscle contracts. So, we see that voltage gated calcium channels, calcium entry is the nerve is happening first, followed by release of acetylcholine and followed by sodium channels opening in the motor end plate. This is sodium channel opening in the nerve, but this is sodium channel opening in the motor end plate means the muscle. So, that is why we go with this option D. 2, 3 and 1 which means calcium entry first followed by release of acetylcholine followed by sodium channel opening in the motor end plate of the muscle. Over to question number 4. A woman suffering from sunburn when enjoying a vacation on beach. Now while taking a shower with lukewarm water 40 degree clearly lukewarm water tells you that it is a non-painful stimulus but still Touching her back caused her to feel pain. So what is the answer? Non-painful stimulus is giving you more pain. Yes, it is allodynia. It is not hyperalgesia. It is allodynia. Hyperalgesia means a painful stimulus is giving you more pain. 
Allodynia is a non-painful stimulus will give you more pain. Innocuous. The meaning of innocuous means non-harmful or non-painful stimulus. So innocuous thermal receptor and allodynia. So this is the answer for this question. I'm so happy that we had discussed this also in uh, Manipal Mede's physiology regular videos for pain physiology. So where I mentioned that painful stimulus giving you exaggerated pain is hyperalgesia and absolutely non-painful stimulus is giving you more pain. This is allodynia. What is the significance of this option C? Thermal receptor and allodynia. Thermal receptor, if it is going to give you pain, it means the temperature has crossed more than 45 degree because only temperatures more than 45 degree can become painful. That is called thermal nociception. Since clearly it is mentioned as 40 degree, so we will go with the option B, innocuous. Innocuous means non-painful stimulus which is giving you more pain, allodynia. Question number 5. Which receptor helps in improvement of insulin resistance in diabetes mellitus 2 with regular exercise and physical activity? The question is about the improvement of insulin resistance and regular exercise. I am so happy that we had discussed the same concept in endocrine pancreas in our Manipal Medes regular videos where I had mentioned about insulin and GLUT4. GLUT4 is called insulin dependent glucose transporter because whenever blood glucose levels are high, insulin opens up GLUT4 in cardiac cells, skeletal muscles and adipose tissue and thereby pushing all this blood glucose into heart cells, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue and that is how insulin is helping you to bring down your blood glucose level. What is that lifestyle modification that we advise for diabetes patients? Walking. What happens when you do regular walking and regular exercise? When you give activity for your skeletal muscles, they need glucose. In order to do the activity, they need more glucose. So automatically regular exercise will open up GLUT4 channels in your skeletal muscles and all this blood glucose is pushed into the skeletal muscles, thereby bringing down your blood glucose level. That is how regular exercise and physical activity through GLUT4 helps to bring down your blood glucose levels. So the answer for question number 5, option B, GLUT4. Over to question number 6. A 64-year-old female presented with headache diagnosed to have a supracellar mass. What is the visual field defect here? What is the significance of supracellar mass? What is present over the cellar tashika? Optic chiasm. We had discussed this in special senses visual pathway where we saw about these optic chiasma. The defect in optic chiasma leads to bitemporal hemianopia because in the optic chiasma, the optic fibers, they have medial and lateral fibers. Both the eyes medial fibers cross in the optic chiasm whereas the lateral fibers go uncrossed. Both the eyes medial fibers are responsible for both the eyes lateral vision or temporal vision. And that is called bitemporal hemianopia. If there is any lesion in the optic chiasm, both the optic nerves medial fibers are cut and therefore the patient experiences bitemporal hemianopia. An optic chiasm is located just over the cella tertica. And that is how supracellar mass results in bitemporal hemianopia. This is a very important uh, repeatedly asked topic, visual pathway, both in ophthal as well as in physiology. Question number 7. After a right limb amputation, patient is experiencing severe pain. What is observed on PET scan in a patient with phantom limb? So the question is on phantom limb phenomena. So we have discussed about phantom limb phenomena in uh, sensory nervous system in our regular class videos. The two important reasons for phantom limb phenomena, law of projection and cortical plasticity. What is cortical plasticity? Cortical plasticity means if any part has been amputated, even after amputation, the brain does reorganization and remapping. And that is how even after amputation of a limb, after a right limb amputation also, 
because of this reorganization and projection of adjacent fibers to overlap to the left sensory cortex. What is the significance of this left sensory cortex here? Why not the right sensory cortex? Because as you know, sensations, the sensory fibers cross to the opposite side and they reach the opposite side sensory cortex of your brain. So if you remove the right limb amputation, so the right limb pain will be carried to the opposite half of the sensory cortex. So projection of adjacent fibers or remapping of these, reorganization of these adjacent fibers to left sensory cortex. So we go with the answer option B. Over to question number 8. Gastrectomy patient needs supplemental, obviously vitamin B12 because in stomach we have parietal cells. Parietal cells secrete intrinsic factor of castle and intrinsic factor of castle is responsible for vitamin B12 absorption. So after gastrectomy, patient will definitely need vitamin B12, cobalamin supplements. And I am so happy to show you this particular slide where we had discussed in detail about vitamin B12 absorption in the chapter GIT, the GIT hormones and secretions, where we also discussed about pernicious anemia. What is pernicious anemia? Intrinsic factor deficiency resulting in B12 deficiency and therefore megaloblastic anemia is called pernicious anemia. Over to question number 9. So this was an um, ABG question where pH was given as 7.2 and bicarbonates of 6.3, PCO2 of 16, I think sodium values somewhere around 130 and chloride values around 110 or 114 I think is the answer is option A. Metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation with increased anion gap. I am so happy to show you this slide on acid base uh, disorders where we had discussed almost the same pattern of question. Uh, the thing is when you have any question on acid base imbalance first look at the pH. Any pH less than 7.35 your diagnosis would be acidosis. Bicarbonate is 6.3. What is the normal levels of bicarbonate? Around 24 milli equivalents. So bicarbonate value has decreased. If bicarbonate has decreased and that has resulted in acidosis, if bicarbonate is the cause, I told you just remember it is metabolic. If carbon dioxide is the cause, then it is respiratory. If bicarbonate is the cause, then it is definitely metabolic. So this is the case of metabolic acidosis. Whenever there is something wrong on the metabolic side, who will compensate? Lungs will compensate. And that is why they have respiratory compensation. What is that respiratory compensation? Body is in acidosis. So to bring down this acidosis, your lung will breathe very fast to send out carbon dioxide. Because carbon dioxide is a volatile acid. If you send out more carbon dioxide, this acidosis can come down. So as you are breathing very fast to push out the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide value also decreases. Because normal PCO2 value is around 40 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Uh, even if you are able to calculate anion gap or if you are not able to calculate also that's okay. Because anyway we have arrived at the option metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. So obviously you can go for option A. And if you want to calculate anion gap, the formula for anion gap is cations should be equal to anions, sodium plus potassium minus bicarbonate plus chloride. This is called the anion gap. So substituting the values also anyways you will have an increased anion gap. Even if you are not able to calculate that also, anyway you have the diagnosis of metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. Acid-base balance, again a very important topic in physiology, in biochemistry and also in medicine. Over to question number 10. A man is having difficulty in sleep during his night. He has habit of drinking coffee one hour before bed every time. Counsel about his the caffeine action and sleep hygiene. I think the question was framed somewhat like this. But it is about adenosine and wakefulness what is the relationship between adenosine and wakefulness so we have discussed this in one of our uh, videos in sleep physiology in our regular class videos in medis where i told you about the neurotransmitters for wakefulness and sleep 
the neurotransmitters responsible for sleep are acetylcholine adenosine and gaba in the brain when levels of acetylcholine gaba and adenosine increases in the brain you feel sleepy so obviously adenosine is responsible for sleepfulness blocking this adenosine you block the sleep and therefore responsible for wakefulness and that is what coffee or caffeine does by blocking adenosine action it causes wakefulness so we'll go with the option a more appropriate option would be option a over to question number 11 this was about sore taste is mediated by which of the following receptor so we had discussed about the taste receptors salt is mainly by enac epithelial sodium channels sour taste can be through many channels enac and also trp p3 receptors whereas umami bitter and sweet are because of g protein coupled receptors so i have clearly told you that umami bitter and sweet are only due to g protein coupled receptors which are metabotropic receptors so for sour taste it is definitely not gpcr which is a metabotropic receptor so it's definitely not b c and d and that's how we go with option a trp p3 some students uh, said it is not trp p3 they said it is v3 if it was v3 then we can't go with this because vaniloid receptor v3 receptor is a temperature receptor so i think it should have been p3 only this is responsible for sour taste question number 12 a few students said there was a question on iodine transport into the thyroid follicle and which um, uh, transporter is helping in this mechanism so if this is a follicular cell on the other side of this follicle we have the colloid and once iodide in the blood when it flows through your thyroid gland this iodide is captured by this follicular cell by this transporter which is called as nis sodium iodide symporter and this captured iodide on the other side moves into the colloid through another transporter which is called pendrin so clearly if the question was how is iodide transported into the follicular cell then it would be sodium iodide symporter if it was how iodine goes into the colloid from the follicular cell then it would be pendrin most of the students said it is into the thyroid follicular cells so we go with sodium iodide symporter which is a secondary active transporter over to question number 13 alcoholic gate nystagmus which lobe of cerebellum is affected so we had discussed this in our regular class videos where i showed you about the parts of the cerebellum vestibulo cerebellum what is the role of vestibulo cerebellum this is the oldest part of the cerebellum it has flocculus and nodulus so it is called floculo nodular lobe and this is responsible for maintaining balance and equilibrium gait means the way you walk is called as gait eye movements vestibular ocular reflex or doll's eye movement that is why when there is any damage to vestibular cerebellum or the floccular nodular lobe you have problem with balance gait and eye movements which is uh, presented as nystagmus so the answer for this question is clearly vestibular cerebellum or floccular nodular lobe over to question number 14 man presents with irregularly irregular pulse dyspnea jvp shows or few students said it was atrial fibrillation a case scenario of atrial fibrillation what is the finding on jvp atrial fibrillation clearly the finding is absent a waves on jvp because what is atrial fibrillation when the heart is beating at high heart rates that we call it as atrial fibrillation so i'll show you this uh, slide where we had discussed about the jvp and the waves of jvp so these are the waves of jvp it has a wave c wave x wave x for atrial relaxation and v wave for atrial venous filling and y wave for atrial emptying and what are the abnormalities in the jvp a wave a for atrial contraction so when will you have a large a wave when there is something wrong with this right side of the heart 
because JVP indicates the right atrial pressure. So A wave for atrial contraction mainly related to the right side. Any kind of right sided obstruction this atrium is going to uh, contract against uh, obstruction there. So the wave would increase. Obviously it would increase. It's very hard to contract against any right sided obstructions. What are the right sided obstructions you can have? Tricuspid valve is on the right side. So tricuspid stenosis. Pulmonary valve is on the right side. Pulmonary stenosis. Right atrial myxoma growth on the right atrium. Pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary stenosis because pulmonary valve is also on the right side. Pulmonary artery is on the right side. So any kind of right sided obstruction, large A wave. When will you have absent A waves? A wave is due to atrial contraction. Only if atrium is contracting properly, you will have proper A wave. If atrium is fibrillating like this at high heart rates, there is no proper atrial contraction. So there is no proper A wave. So atrial fibrillation, absent A waves. Question number 15. JVP in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary stenosis. Few students said uh, there was a question on pulmonary hypertension. Few of them said it was atrial fibrillation. So even if it is pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary stenosis, as we had already discussed in pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary stenosis, large A waves. Large A waves are called as canon waves or giant waves. So we can go with canon A waves or giant waves. Over to question number 16. Female presented to OPD with nasal obstruction, history of recurrent respiratory infection and I think x-ray was given and the x-ray was suggestive of dextrocardia and bronchiectasis. The x-ray finding was related to dextrocardia and bronchiectasis. What would be the most likely diagnosis? So from this history of recurrent respiratory infection, dextrocardia which is situs inversus and bronchiectasis we can go with the diagnosis of Carter Jenner's syndrome. Carter Jenner's syndrome is a problem with dynin. Dynin is a molecular motor responsible for ciliary motility. And the features of Carter Jenner's syndrome, chronic sinusitis, chronic bronchiectasis, situs inverses like dextrocardia and infertility. So probably we can go with a Carter Jenner's syndrome because in young syndrome and cystic fibrosis, we don't see dextrocardia. And Dijorgi syndrome also we don't see dextrocardia. The finding in uh, uh, option D would be uh, mostly VSD, ventricular septal type of defect in CVS. So hence the answer is option A. Over to question number 17. Few students said there was a question, a case history, something on uh, pneumothorax. What will happen to lung volume and thoracic volume? So if there was a question like this, in pneumothorax, if this is the lung and this is the chest wall, what is pneumothorax? Accumulation of air in the thoracic cavity. So if you have air in this thoracic cavity, this air would expand. It would push the chest wall outside. So this chest wall would be pushed out like this. If the chest wall is pushed out, thoracic volume increases. So there is an increase in thoracic volume. And this air when it expands it will push the lung inside when the lung is pushed inside lung would collapse so lung volume would decrease so thoracic volume increases and lung volume decreases yes with that we complete our discussion on uh, physiology recall questions in NEET PG 2024 you are definitely more stronger than you think yes Please stay strong and definitely the magic is going to happen and wait for the day for your results. Definitely my prayers to all of you to get good results and get the PG seat of your choice very soon. And we are so happy about our Manipal Medis, uh, the recorded video content where most of the questions are uh, repeated from our exact PYQs discussion or uh, the mini test and the grand test subject wise test we had conducted and um, I would suggest you uh, to read from here because most of the content or all of the content are prepared exclusively by our faculty and we do not outsource the questions the faculty who takes the class takes the questions also for you and we have many interesting uh, features like faculty connect where you find interesting reels kind of videos which would make your learning more enjoyable and we also have customized study plan 
which would uh, even more enhance your preparation so thank you so much to all of you for watching this session in case you find uh, any changes in the questions also you can feel free to post in the comment box thank you so much for watching thank you